Good evening. I'm Dan Finn, and it's my pleasure this evening to invite you to enjoy this lecture by William Gale. Um, I will do an introduction from him in a moment, but I want to say a little bit about the plan here for this evening, and that is that um, Dr. Gale will speak for about 40 or 45 minutes. Uh, we will then have a period of question and answer, and we'll break by 9.30. So I invite everyone, including those who are less experienced with college lectures, to stay for the full 90 minutes. Uh, you'll find a lot of the questions and answer periods are more interesting than the lectures themselves. So, <laughs> which can only happen with a good lecture, uh, but sometimes people can press the lecture on topics he may not have addressed fully. Uh, and we are in an election season, and we'll see how that goes. Um, our speaker this evening uh, is the R.J. and Francis Miller Chair in Federal Economic Policy at the Brookings Institution. He's also the director of the Retirement Security Project there and of the Tax Policy Center. He was a senior economist at the Council of Economic Advisors and spent four years teaching in the Department of Economics at UCLA. Uh, he has his, BA, his uh, bachelor's degree from, in economics from Duke and his Ph.D. in economics from Stanford. He has worked with or advised a wide range of organizations around the world, including the World Economic Forum, the Tax Reform Project, Congress's Joint Committee on Taxation, the General Accounting Office, National Tax Association, the Eternal Revenue Service, and many others. He has been a referee or reviewer for just about every major academic economics journal there is. Economics, uh, the Economic Journal, the American Economic Review, the Journal of Economic Literature, uh, the Review of Economics and Statistics, and a host of policy-oriented journals as well. He has edited many volumes, uh, and uh, including one on the evolving pension system, and one particularly pleasing to those of us here tonight who, like me, are enjoying seniority in the American society called Aging Gracefully, something most of us try to do. And uh, he has journal articles and book chapters of all sorts, uh, including one on the value-added tax possible for the United States, the effects of tax simplification, um, the role of intergenerational transfers in wealth accumulation, rhetoric and economics in the estate tax debate, and even one called What Americans Can Learn from the British Tax System. And a number of popular articles in op-ed pieces and so forth uh, one about the federal budget that he entitled, Still Crazy After All These Years. <laughs> Another on the same budgetary topic, especially appropriate at two Catholic colleges, I suppose, called Faith-Based Budgeting. <laughs> and finally, two titles that you'll have to follow up on him personally after the lecture as to what secrets are included, because I have not read these. But one helpful-sounding article is The Answer to Your 401k Woes. Always good to know. And the most mysterious title in his CV, Dead Men Don't Buy Gas. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what's in that one, but you'll, you can find out. Please join me in welcoming Dr. William Gale. I think you've looked at my CV more recently than I have. <laughs> Uh, all right, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Dan, Finn, uh, Michael King, who drove me from the airport here, President uh, Nemeseth, for all the hospitality you all are showing me. Uh, I want to talk about the fiscal situation. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the campaign, but I will answer questions about that. So if you're looking for incentives to stay, uh, you can you can do that. I do want to say that fiscal policy, it feels very appropriate for me to be talking about this issue here because I've only been on campus a couple of hours, but I can tell you that there's a feeling of community here that's tangible and special. And as a nation, we're going to need a lot more of that uh, to get through this fiscal issue. Uh, it's not just about economics, it's about values and it's about working jointly with other people, including people that you don't necessarily agree with or like, uh, uh, to find a solution to these issues. So I'm particularly gratified that students are here because Dan's generation and my generation are going to be passing this issue on to all of you. Uh, 
So while you're listening, you should be thinking about how you're going to solve this situation, uh, since it's virtually certain that it will end up in your lap uh, in, in, in the near future. Uh, I may well spend a lot of time looking at the screen as well, because the lights are really, really white. And I, I can't see past the fourth row here. So, so if, forgive me if I'm looking this way. But um, all right, let me, let me get started. Uh, I, if there's a single issue I want to, thank you. If there's a single <laughs> issue uh, that I want to get across, it's um, that we, this issue with three different deficits. There's a tendency to talk about the deficit. And there's really three different situations that are going on that often get confused. It's important to keep them straight because the problems are different, the solutions are different, et cetera. Uh, so I, w I want to frame that first. Then we'll talk about, very briefly, how we got here, because this is, this is not the smartest situation to be in. So there's a question of you know, what happened, how did, how did we get here? Uh, then where we're headed, um, uh, over the, the, typically in Washington, we divide the budget forecast into the next 10 years. And then the longer term, uh, that's a budgetary convenience. But it turns out to also be substantively right in terms of thinking about the various issues. Uh, and then I'll talk briefly about why deficits are a concern. That is, that is uh, uh, you know, there is sort of a so what element to this. There is sort of a, a uh, well, this is just something that people in Washington talk about. Why should you care? And the answer is you should care a lot. And I'll talk about why. And then I'll talk about, uh, sorry, then I'll turn to solutions, talk about spending solutions, tax solutions. And then the last question, what does it take? What, what will it take for us as a society to actually do this? Uh, and every time I talk to Dan, he uh, cuts the, the time of the talk down by five minutes. So, so I'm now down to 40 or 45 minutes. I will, uh, that'll be about right. And uh, 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 there'll be lots of time for questions, uh, which is actually my favorite part uh, uh, of, of the talk. Because I know what I'm going to say. I don't know what, 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 what you're going to say. OK. So I said there are three different deficits. Uh, and uh, conveniently recover. Uh, we need to impose uh, significant, not, not draconian, but significant fiscal restraint uh, to, to get deficits down, to, to get the debt to GDP ratio stable. And I'll show you all pictures of, of all this more. But I want to highlight that the short-term deficits are different from the medium-term deficits. The short-term deficits are mainly a function of a weak economy. The medium-term deficits that persist after the economy recovers, they're evidence of a structural imbalance. Right, then, not surprisingly, the long-term deficit starts 10 years from now. And this is essentially layered on top of the medium-term deficits. What happens is Medicare and Medicaid spending are expected to start rising dramatically at that point, both because of an increase in uh, the number of elderly and uh, continuing increases in the cost of health care uh, per person. So after 2022, there's, a, there's a, basically a health care uh, crisis. Not crisis. I, I, it's not a good word to use. Because if you say something is a crisis and you don't do anything about it, and you wake up the next morning and you're still alive, then it wasn't really a crisis. So uh, the, for, forgive the hyperbole, but uh, there's a health care situation that with, with health care spending continuing to rise, and that's on top of the medium-term imbalance. And all of that is assuming that the economy does quite well. So um, the issue there, of course, is to control health care spending. And that's where the Medicare debates come in in the campaign. That's where uh, Medicaid issues come in as well. But the key issue that I want to emphasize is these short-term, medium-term, long-term things have different causes. Uh, they have different effects on the economy. And they present different solutions. We will, the long-term. We will have to get health care spending under control. Uh, in the medium term, we need to figure out how we want to balance spending and taxes. In the short run, our main consideration ought to be getting the economy going again, uh, because if the economy doesn't get healthier, uh, you can kiss budget, the, the budget goodbye. The, the, a strong economy is necessary, but not sufficient uh, to get the budget in order. All right, how did we get here? Um, this graph shows you two lines. The bottom line is uh, my effort to convince you that uh, uh, economists have a sense of humor. Um, 
What that line shows is what the budget projection as of 2001, uh, when the debt to GDP ratio was about 32% of GDP, and the economy was going great. This is right at the beginning of 2001, so the you know, end of 2000, the economy was going strong. We had these go-go years in the 90s. Uh, deficits turned to surplus. And the, the forecast was that if everything was left alone, that it would just continue that way. You'll notice that that line crosses the zero uh, mark on the y-axis at about 2008. Okay, what that means is we, it was expected that we would pay off all federal debt as of 2008. All right. And then we, we would start accumulating surpluses. That really was the projection. Uh, Alan Greenspan went to Congress and said, uh, you can't let that happen uh, because then I can't run monetary policy. The way monetary policy works is the Fed buys and sells government bonds. And if there are no government bonds out there, then they can't run monetary policy. All right, so uh, that was Alan Greenspan's famous conversion from a deficit hawk uh, to a tax cut advocate, and that gave Congress permission, more or less, to go ahead and cut taxes, as they did uh, in 2001. But uh, uh, as we look forward on the deficit problem, it's easy to get pessimistic, but note that here is a situation where we were worried that we were run out of, going to run out of debt and we're a can-do country, and we solved that problem. <laughs> and uh, so there is some hope. Uh, anyway, then the top line shows you what actually happened. The, the debt to GDP rose somewhat during the, during the early part of the decade, and then when the recession hit in, and the financial crisis hit in around 2008, then uh, the deficit took off, and, or the, the debt to GDP ratio took off, rather, which, which reflects the fact that uh, the deficit rose. All right, so that's how we got here. Uh, well, let me, let me say a little bit more about that. That, that difference, it's, it's tempting, it's often ascribed, the whole difference is often ascribed to the Bush tax cuts. Uh, that's not correct. Uh, it is correct, we cut taxes in 2001, and again a couple years later, and again the year after that. But we also increased military spending, we increased Medicare spending, the Part D provision was passed early in the decade, all without financing. So we increased spending. The question is, how did we respond to these surpluses at the beginning of the decade? The answer is we cut taxes, we increased spending. The economy took a hit early in the decade, and so uh, the surpluses vanished. And then, uh, uh, so by the time the recession hit, uh, uh, we were in a situation where uh, we had not we had not, in the sort of the seven years of famine, seven years of plenty type of thing, we had not used our seven years of plenty to save up money. And so when the recession hit, the deficit skyrocketed and the debt uh, took off. But it was both a spending increase and a tax cut uh, issue over, over the course of the decade. All right, uh, where are we headed? Well, it, it turns out that that very simple question uh, has two answers. One. Uh, I once gave a talk about this particular issue and said if this were uh, a Sesame Street issue, it would be brought to you by the words down and big and bad, and uh, some number like six trillion or something like that. Uh, but basically, where we're headed depends crucially on what kind of assumptions you make. Uh, and right now, one of the problems in Washington, you may have heard, is the fiscal cliff. Uh, what that reflects is that almost every major feature of our tax system right now uh, has a major feature expiring uh, at the end of this year. So the income tax cuts that were passed early in the last decade expire, the payroll tax cuts expire, some corporate incentives expire, uh, the estate tax uh, reverts back to pre-2001 law, unless Congress take, takes action. So um, depending on what you assume about what happens to those tax cuts, uh, you can get very different estimates for what happens over the next decade. Uh, so what I've got here is three projections. The CBO baseline, uh, the Congressional Budget Office is sort of the sort of central arbiter of, of uh, all budget issues. If you can only go one place in D.C. for budget information, it should be CBO. Uh, they have a baseline estimate which shows the deficit dropping dramatically from now to 2015. 
and, uh, and then bumping along at 1% or 2% of GDP. That's what will happen if we go over the fiscal cliff and don't make any other policies uh, changes. What the baseline shows is what happens if Congress does nothing over the next 10, 10 years. Passes no new tax laws, no new spending laws. Uh, just, it just sits there. And a lot of people, uh, given the alternative, think that that may not be such a bad uh, outcome. But the problem is it's not thought to be very realistic. And so this extended policy uh, projection is uh, an estimate that I've been doing uh, ever since the 1990s when surpluses first came out. I was kind of curious why uh, uh, it was one of these, like, don't be afraid to ask the dumb question type of thing. I was curious, where do, you know, what does it mean we have a surplus? Where's the surplus coming from? And so on. What the extended policy scenario does is basically say, instead of assuming that t Congress is going to do nothing over the next 10 years, assume they're going to they're act the next 10 years like they did the last 10 years. So it's kind of a business as usual approach, which essentially assumes that they extend all the tax cuts. Uh, they, there are a couple of items on the spending side uh, that the baseline assumes will die, uh, but the current policy, the extended policy assumes will be continued. I'll just give you one example of this. There's a law about Medicare that if Medicare growth rates are too high, then the gov or above a certain level, specified level, the government will then cut the amount it pays to doctors over the next year. All right. Every year for the past eight years, Medicare growth has been higher than that threshold. And every year for the past eight years, Congress has waived the requirement that the government cut the, the, the payment. So if you follow current law, government's going to cut the payment and they're going to save $300 billion over the next decade. If you follow extended policy, then you assume no, Congress is going to cave on this and they're going to have another $300 billion of spending. So uh, it turns out that just those few differences, extending the tax cuts, uh, being realistic about the Medicare adjustment, uh, some other issues like that, makes an enormous difference in what happens. So in the extended policy, uh, we're talking about deficits that get just below four, but then again, as I mentioned, they start rising over the decade. And this is the period when the economy should be uh, back at full employment. And so the, the deficit rising here under the extended policy is not, not a healthy sign. All right, now you might wonder where the administration is. Well, it turns out the Obama budget is right in the middle. Uh, so if you want to compare it to current law, you say Obama is raising the deficit a lot. If you want to compare it to business as usual, you can say Obama is cutting the deficit. Uh, both of those are accurate statements. And uh, uh, let me just leave it at that and not try to parse it uh, farther. But under the administration's policy, uh, uh, deficits would stabilize at 3% of GDP uh, once the economy recovers. And this is just shows you what happens to the public debt over those forecasts. Uh, the only, only two numbers that are it, it here, the deficit under extended policy is getting up about 84% of GDP. I should say this is net, this is debt held by the public. There's another figure called gross debt, which I'm going to ask you to just pay no attention to. You can ask me about it, but it, it's, it's a totally misleading uh, statistic that people like to cite. Uh, but notice under current law, the, ba the debt would actually fall. That is, that is, we would be reducing the debt to GDP ratio over time if Congress just did nothing. Right. Think about that for a second. All right. Um, so then that kind of ends the good news portion of the talk. <laughs> um, after 2022, you get Medicare and Medicaid spending rising, and then you get these astronomical debt to GDP ratio. So it, the debt to GDP ratio would hit 200% of GDP in 2042. Uh, you know, it, it's not really going to go up to 800% of GDP. It's just because something will happen before then. Uh, uh, but that is the path that we were, that we're on in terms of, the, of um, uh, the budget. Now, you can say, well, under the optimistic scenario, it's better. The answer to the response to which is yes, but nobody believes the optimistic scenario uh, will actually happen uh, in, the, in, in the absence of some huge change of, of attitude on the part of the government. 
All right, and let me come back to that, because when we, when we say attitude on part of the government, we, we mean attitude on part of the people. Okay. So the next question is, so what? We're going, you know, we're going over the cliff, uh, or we're, we're crashing into the wall, whatever your metaphor you want to use. Uh, who cares about the budget deficit? Uh, you know, why does it matter? How does it affect your life? And uh, there's a different answer in a weak economy in the short term versus a fully employed economy uh, in the long term. One of the things that's unfortunate about economics is there, there are two different phenomena that are referred to as economic expansion or economic growth, but they're actually two different things. They're, they're entirely different uh, mechanisms. Uh, in the short run, in a weak economy, we think the problem is there's not enough aggregate spending. And so the answer to that is to boost uh, spending via either government spending or tax cuts that puts money in people's pockets. It basically brings the aggregate demand curve back out uh, to the full employment uh, economy. Uh, in a strong economy, uh, the way the economy expands is by building the supply side. Uh, of the economy. So it's more labor, more capital, better labor, better capital, uh, better functioning markets, etc. cetera. Uh, and that's totally the opposite of, of what pays off in a short-term economy, or, or in, in a weak economy, rather. And so the, the solutions, naturally, are different in the weak economy and a strong economy. The deficit is the increase in aggregate demand. That's a good solution in a weak economy, but it's a bad solution in a strong economy because the aggregate demand can't increase output at that point. All it does is uh, generate inflation. Uh, but in both cases, uh, deficits, by raising aggregate demand, they'll reduce national saving. Now, you may think that this, this, this contradiction between short-term and long-term uh, is unique to economics, but uh, it, it comes up in a lot of areas. And the, that, that, the best example I can give is uh, caffeine. Um, if you think of, you know, it's, 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 say it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you're in a lecture, the guy is droning on about fiscal policy, you're getting tired, all right, you, you, you need a hit, all right, well, what do you do? Well, caffeine and sugar are really good in that situation to give you a boost to get going, etc. However, in the long run, a steady diet of caffeine and sugar is not only not going to help you, it's going to hurt you. And what you need to do in the long run is get enough rest, eat right, exercise, et cetera, and that will give you more energy. And that's almost an exact match between the caffeine, the aggregate demand hit in the short run, and you know, building the framework, literally and figuratively, of your body uh, in the long run. The same thing is going on here in the economy. Uh, deficit policy is effective as a short-run tool, or can be effective as a short-run tool in a weak economy, but a steady diet of deficits, even after the economy recovers, leads to this escalating debt-to-GDP ratio, uh, which is not sustainable. Uh, so, in, again, in both cases, in the short run and the long run, the deficits increase aggregate demand, aggregate consumption, which means they reduce national saving, and uh, in the short run, that's helpful because the economy needs to be back at full employment. In the long term, that's an issue, that's a problem, because national saving is what finances the increase in education, the increase in labor, the increase in investment that we need uh, to, to expand the economy uh, over time. Um, there, this issue about deficits in the, in the economy, let me, let me just give you another example. Um, the idea is the government borrows more money, uh, that leaves less money available for business sector to invest. That means there's less investment. That means there's less capital per worker. That means workers aren't as productive as that would, they, they would otherwise be. That means their uh, wages are not as high as they would otherwise be. So you get this double whammy that's put on future generations from consistent deficits. Not only do you have the higher interest payments, the debt payments to make, uh, so you have more burdens, but because there's less capital per worker, wages are lower than they otherwise would be. So workers have less income to begin with, and they have more claims against their income uh, in terms of higher mortgages, so uh, higher, higher interest payments. But when, when people say deficits mortgage are, are, are mortgaging our future, that's what they mean. They mean the combination 
of higher interest payments we will have to make, which again, which sort of diverts from other government spending, and the lower wages that result from a lower capital stock. So this is sometimes a hard thing to conceive. Um, so the example I have in my head is, you, if you walk by a lot, you know, a, a, an abandoned lot where there's this building that's collapsed into a heap of rubble, it would be very natural to say, oh, that earthquake last year caused that building to collapse. You know, that, that, that makes sense to people. You can see it. It's tangible, et cetera. But if you walk past a vacant lot, you don't naturally think, oh, because the government borrowed so much money, there's not enough money for the business sector to invest, so the building was, wasn't built uh, to begin with. But that's the nature of the economic cost of the deficit. It's other things that, that, that can't be done uh, because the government is using the, the uh, national saving uh, for its own spending. All right, so these effects, I won't go into the numbers, but these effects are big. If you look at the effects of sustained 6% of GDP deficits, they are enormous. They're 10 times bigger than anything you can get from tax reform, anything you can get from regulatory reform. Uh, uh, you know, we, we look for policies that can affect growth, the growth rate by a tenth of a percentage point. Uh, these things are, are persistent deficits would reduce the, the growth rate by a half a percentage point, three quarters of a percentage point. These are, if you do the cumulative math over 10, 20, 30 years, these are monstrously large uh, impacts, uh, much larger than, than, um, than other policies that we typically deal with. All right, so now that I've uh, scared you enough, oh, I see I'm out of time. Uh, now, let me, let me talk some about solutions. Um, again, there's a short-term, long-term issue where deficits can be helpful in the short term, but their sustained deficits in a strong economy uh, are not going to do any good. Uh, what Washington is doing right now is they don't want to cut uh, in the long term because they're worried about the politics of that. And they don't want to stimulate in the short term, again, because of the politics. Republicans don't want to admit that government spending can help. And Democrats don't want to admit that we need more government stimulus. So they're not doing either. They're not stimulating in the short run. And they're not cutting uh, in the long term. Uh, what they should be doing is both. I mean, it's, it's a false choice to say we either have to cut the deficit or raise the deficit. What we need to do is stimulate now and cut the deficit later. Uh, I think. People know this, but it's maybe too complex a message to, to pass along. But let's talk about the medium term uh, and the long term. That's really where the money is. Um, the government spending is the subject of a lot of attention. Is there's a single statistic you should know about it. It's that almost all of it is in one of five items. Right? So Social Security it currently, or as of the end of the decade, will be a quarter of all government spending. Medicare, Medicaid will be almost a third. Uh, defense, 14%. Net interest, 17%. The total of those five items is 87% of government spending. Right? So when people talk about, you know, when Rick Perry had his three uh, government agencies that he wanted to close, uh, I actually forget what they were. But uh, <laughs> I, I assure you they were trivial. Uh, everything else the government does is 13% of government spending. Right? And so everything else the government does is not even as big as defense spending. Uh, and so you, know, you can talk about closing the national parks. You can talk about shutting down EPA or education. Uh, you can talk about foreign aid, which in polls, by the way, people think are like 27% of the federal budget. It's actually 1% of the federal budget uh, or, or less. Uh, you can talk about all those things, but they're not going to make a difference. Uh, or not, not going to make much of a difference. Um, you, so ultimately, it's going to be, on the spending side, the, the restraint is going to come from Social Security, health care, or the military. I mean, you, the whole point is not to default. right? You could cut net interest, but if we default, if we're willing to default, we don't have to worry about any of this. Uh, presumably, presumably, the idea is we don't want to default. So let me talk about each of those very briefly. Um, Social Security is, without a doubt, the most successful American initiative in history. It's vastly reduced poverty among the elderly. Uh, it's provided all sorts of uh, insurance. It's not just a retirement pay 
program, it's a, it's a survivor's program, it's a disability uh, program, et cetera. Uh, you hear a lot about privatization of Social Security, uh, but privatization won't actually solve the problem. Right? There's, I should have said this at the outset of the, of the talk. There's only two ways to solve this problem, and everyone knows what they are. You either cut spending or you raise taxes. Okay? And, and the same thing is true with Social Security. You either cut benefits or you raise the revenue coming into the system through, through, through payroll taxes, for example. There are a number of ways that that, that can happen. Uh, raising the retirement age, uh, the retirement age actually is going up right now, a month per per year, over over uh, I think 24 years. So it'll be I think it will rise to 67 uh, in a few years. Raising that a few more years would make a big difference. Uh, if you raise it like a month a year or a month every two years for the next 48 years, which doesn't seem that draconian, uh, you could save a fair amount of money. Flattening the benefit structure, uh, one of the things my mom complains about is her social security benefits are too high. Uh, there's a lot of people like her who don't actually need the benefits, but of course would be stupid not to take them if the government's sending them. Uh, raising the payroll tax cap is another option that's discussed right now. The payroll tax covers the first about 110,000 of, of earnings. Uh, that could be raised. That, that number has fallen in recent years. But I think uh, of these three, I think flattening the benefit structure is the best option. Uh, and you can, you can get a fair amount of the way to a solution just doing that and gradually raising the retirement age. And it's hard to believe that, that productive lifespans won't continue to increase. And if you raise, uh, you raise the benefit structure, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the retirement age, uh, gradually over time, that will actually save a fair amount of money. Uh, in contrast, raising the retirement age in Medicaid, or Medicare rather, does not save money. Uh, basically people, if you look at the age profile of people's health expenditures, they basically go along, then they have one very bad episode, then they die. And so 65 year olds, 66 year olds don't cost that much in Medicare. So raising retirement age won't help you much there. Um, I would love to talk more about health care, but let me just talk a, a few highlights of this. One is this is the, this and taxes are the two single biggest issues in the long term uh, fiscal situation. Uh, two is nobody really knows how to control health care spending. It's, it's clear how to control social security. You just cut benefits. Uh, but in health care spending, in Medicare, if you cut benefits, you will find uh, charges coming up in other parts of the system. Uh, if, you, if you control Medicare, you will find charges coming up in the non-Medicare part of the system, the cross-subsidized. And so uh, there's basically two approaches that people have talked about taking. Uh, and borrowing from the pension literature, one of them is the, the, what you might call the defined benefit approach. That's what we currently have now, which is if you go into Medicare, you get the benefits that, you, that you're eligible for. And the idea behind the, the changing the defined benefit approach is trying to wring savings out of the system. You may have heard about paying doctors to do things we want them to do, not paying them to do things we don't want them to do. Uh, there's a lot of active experimentation going on trying to understand what works, what doesn't work, and then changing the compensation system uh, so that we subsidize what works and we don't pay for what doesn't work. Um, that's also called death panels, if you don't like that idea. But that, that's the basic idea, is, is to develop better standards of care and change what the government's willing to pay for, what they're not willing to pay for. Uh, the alternative is a defined contribution plan, which is, uh, in raw form, it's a voucher system. The government gives you a piece of paper worth X thousand dollars, says you can use this X thousand dollars to go out and buy life insurance, or, or health insurance. Um, uh, in this more sophisticated form, it's called a premium support system where the government builds in subsidies for low-income households. It, it develops exchanges where health insurance policies are offered uh, for sale and so on. The nice thing about it is that it controls government costs because once the government's paid its voucher, its costs are done, are set. So it's defined contribution in that sense on the government's part. Uh, the bad thing is it just literally transfers the risk to the individual. 
right? And, and uh, so it's solving the bean counting part of the health care problem as far as it relates to government spending, but it's not solving the bigger health care situation uh, with rising health care costs. So let me just tag that and move on. Uh, defense spending, uh, this poor guy, Admiral Mike Mullen, gets cited now by every budget uh, expert in the world because of what he said, that our national debt is our biggest national security threat. Um, this is another way of saying, or this is an example of the idea that there are more than just economic costs to running large deficits. Countries that run large deficits over long periods of time lose political power, they lose military power, uh, and as he mentioned, uh, 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 this is a, a threat to, to our defense posture. Hillary Clinton has mentioned this as a, as a threat to our diplomatic posture, uh, and so on. Uh, the defense cut literature is kind of geeky. I'd be happy to talk about it if people want, but let me turn to the tax side uh, in my remaining few minutes. Um, we need to consider taxes as part of the solution here. Doing everything on the spending side would generate draconian cuts, and uh, it would also generate a political equilibrium that's not uh, particularly satisfactory. Um, so there, are, there is this thing called the No New Taxes Pledge, which about 90% of Republicans in Congress have signed. Uh, and uh, we can talk about this when we talk about the fiscal cliff issue in, in Q&A if you want. Uh, but it, it, it is a binding constraint on the Republicans in Congress. Uh, nevertheless, the U.S. has capacity to raise taxes. Our taxes are really low relative to other countries, relative to our historical norms. Uh, public opinion polls consistently show that people want a combination uh, of tax increases and spending cuts. Uh, and perhaps the most important thing is this notion of community or shared sacrifice. Uh, the only way to get higher income households to contribute to deficit reduction is through tax increases, because they're not basically benefiting from government spending. So if you want each income group or each economic group to share in the burden, that we've created as a society, the only way to get at high-income households is through, is through tax increases. All right, there are a couple of other arguments here, too, which is that actually raising taxes to pay for spending would be more effective in constraining spending than, uh, than not raising taxes to pay for spending. But that, 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 um, that takes a while to explain. So let me, let me move on. Basically, uh, in the past, we've done a combination of spending cuts and tax increases and the deficit deals that have worked. Social Security uh, in 90, in 93, uh, those deals were fashioned specifically to include both tax increases and deficit and spending cuts and they, they were lasting uh, because of that. Because there was a political equilibrium, uh, they were lasting. That's the good news. The bad news is those changes are nowhere near big enough uh, for what we face now. Uh, th those changes cut the deficit by one and a half, two percent of GDP max on an annual basis, and we need to do, we need to do a lot more than that uh, currently. So uh, there are three sort of non-crazy ways to raise taxes, and uh, I'll talk about them briefly. One is reforming the income tax. The second is taxing pollution, which basically means taxing conventional energy. And the third is tax and consumption. Uh, income tax reform, uh, the way to do this, there's two ways to do it. You can raise rates or you can broaden the tax base. Uh, every economist in the world, every tax economist in the world thinks you should broaden the tax base. Uh, that is, get rid of the special exclusions, deductions, exemptions, credits, loopholes, etc., uh, or get rid of as many as you can. That has a lot of advantages. It's simpler because it's, there are fewer of these loopholes to deal with. It's fairer because different forms of income and different forms of consumption are being treated the same, whereas right now there's great variation in how different forms of income and different forms of spending are being treated. Uh, and the best, it, it's more efficient because you're not distorting people's choices about how to use their funds or how to generate their funds. But the best thing is there's a lot of revenue in, in tax expenditures. And, uh, uh, Raw estimates are between a trillion and a trillion and a half per year, right? So that's that's between seven and ten percent of GDP 
that we give away through credits and deductions. We, the size of these tax expenditures uh, are as large as the income, as the revenue we currently generate from the income tax. So very big numbers. Uh, and there are ways to do this. Actually, uh, Governor Romney suggested capping itemized deductions uh, a couple of days ago. That's one way to raise revenue. Um, uh, another way is to go through these things one by one and talk about whether what's their justification, their economic justification. For example, uh, the economic case for mortgage interest deduction is a pr particularly weak, and uh, we could get rid of most or all of that, I think. Uh, the, whereas the argument in favor of charitable contributions, I'm not saying this just because I work for a nonprofit organization, but the argument in favor of charitable contributions is much stronger. Uh, we do need to put some limits on employer health insurance and so on. But reforming the, the income tax is one big way to do it, to raise revenue. Uh, a value-added tax is another. We're the only major country in the world that doesn't have a value-added tax. Uh, actually, we're practically the only country. There's something like 150 countries have value-added taxes. Uh, it's basically a tax on consumption. Uh, so it would, if you want to reduce consumption, raise national saving, this is the way to do it. Uh, and you can, again, you can generate significant amounts of money uh, via a value-added tax. European countries often raise like 3 to 5% of GDP uh, in value-added taxes. Uh, and the last way is an energy tax. Um, unlike any other tax in the world, an energy tax is actually uh, a first best tax. I always thought that was a normal expression, but uh, uh, friends of mine that are not economists tell me that that's actually quite a geeky expression. The idea is most economists, most, most economists are second best. Most taxes are second best. That is, you don't want to have a distortion, but if you have one, you want to minimize it. You want to minimize the distortion that the, the, ta the tax generates in the economy. An energy tax is a first best tax because there's already a distortion out there, which is that there's an externality from pollution. People who use carbon, emit carbon, uh, are not paying the full societal costs of the use of the carbon because there are costs in terms of uh, either local pollution and the health effects, congestion, global warming, uh, et cetera. And so imposing a tax on carbon use or carbon emission is actually a first best tax. It would increase the efficiency of the economy, whereas normally what we're trying to do is the minimal damage to the efficiency of the economy. A carbon tax would increase the efficiency. If we can't go to a carbon tax, uh, there's always our good old friend, the gas tax, which is, of course already exists. Uh, the US, uh, sorry, a carbon tax, uh, if, if you had an oil tax and a coal tax, you'd be a very long way to a, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, a gas tax and a coal tax. You'd be a very long way toward a carbon tax. So you can't get a carbon tax. We still have the gas tax, and you could generate significant revenue uh, even something as simple as raising the gas tax 25 cents a year for 10 years would end up generating between 1.5 and 2% of GDP in revenues. That's a significant amount of money uh, from what would be a smart tax uh, and uh, uh, would increase our tax, our gasoline taxes toward European levels, but would still leave them lower uh, than than. Than, than European levels. All right, let me just sum up here. You've been very patient with me. Uh, what's it going to take to do all this stuff? I mean, none of this stuff sounds like fun. Nobody wants to go out and cut spending. Nobody wants to go out and raise taxes. Uh, so how do we get this done? Um, one scenario is there's a crisis, and Congress has to do something. Or, okay, politicians have to do something. Uh, this is going to sound strange. I'm not optimistic that we're going to have a crisis. Okay, I, to be clear, I don't think that's going to happen to the U.S. We are not a small uh, uh, country that, that we're, we're not Greece or Spain or Italy. We're not in a union. They, they have problems in part because they're tied to the euro and they can't adjust their domestic policy. We don't have those kind of problems. We, despite these big deficits, we have very low interest rates, which is an indication that capital is coming into the U.S. from around the world. Uh, and if the money were to leave the U.S. en masse, uh, 
it would have to go somewhere, right? And and I I'm just I don't think that that scenario is going to happen. Now that that's that's bad news, not good news, because of these pernicious these long-term pernicious growth effects of budget deficits that I talked about. But I don't think we can count on a bond market crisis uh, to get Congress to act. Uh, what we're going to need is a combination of White House leadership and essentially a centrist coalition uh, in the Congress. No party wants to do this by themselves, all right? Not because they don't think this needs to be done, they do. But anything that gets done that's serious is going to have some odious parts to it. And each party wants to blame the other party for the parts that they don't like. So they want to go back to their constituents and say, look, we fought really hard for everything, but we had to give up X, Y, Z because they made us do it and they gave us ABC instead. And then the other party goes back to their people and say, look, we fought really hard and they gave us ABC, but we had to give up X, Y, you know, that type of thing. Uh, nobody wants to have ownership of the whole problem uh, uh, for that reason. Uh, so let me close on an optimistic note. Despite all of this, uh, I think we can do this. Uh, I think if you went back and read, I keep saying this, I, I actually ought to do this. I think if you went back and read the civil rights literature, you know, in the media or, or books that were written 50, 60, 70 years ago about this, you would find a level of vitriol and anger uh, uh, and disrespect that far exceeds e even the low levels we've seen uh, in the budget debate. And um, one of the things about our country is, is this is how we do things. I mean, it's messy. Uh, people get angry. Uh, the title of this talk is Fiscal Therapy, and something about America's addiction to debt. Uh, part of what I had in mind there was uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief where the first stage is denial, and the second stage is anger. And uh, I think the country, uh, I'm not a psychologist, but it feels to me like the country is somewhere between those two things right now. And uh, you have to get through that in order to get to a solution. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of anger. There's going to be a lot of vitriol. Uh, but in a way, that's good. That shows that we're moving through the steps we need to move through. Um, so I do believe we will come up with a solution, and I can tell you more about why I think that. Uh, but it's, it's easy to be pessimistic about it, but uh, especially if you're a student, you need to be optimistic, again, because this is going to be your problem soon. And uh, so let me close on that note and just say I'm delighted to be here, and I would be equally delighted to take questions. Thank you. So, we've got some time. Could we have the lights up, please? Uh, we have microphones in the corners. Uh, maybe somebody could move those out from the corner a little bit more visible, if you would, people out in the corner. Um, so, if you have a question, please walk to the mic so everybody can hear it. Uh, we've also, this is also being filmed. I guess we don't film anymore, do we? Uh, digitally recorded. Uh, and... Um, so we'd like to also make sure we can hear your question for the recording as well. But I really would encourage you to step forward, students, please, others, uh, questions or comments uh, as, we, as we go. So please walk to the mic and ask your question. Do you want to field questions, Bill, or shall I? Oh, I'm okay. You're on. You just okay. recognize people at the, at the mics. Go to it. <clears throat> Back in the 60s, um, when Heller was chairman of the council, the um, mathematically engineered tax cut worked out almost perfectly. And this was kind of the heyday of economists uh, because it worked so well, I guess. Um, we don't see as much in the media about the council anymore. Uh, could you comment on the extent to which uh, recent administrations are actually using the economic expertise that they hire. Uh, uh, 
So for background, there's a group called the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, which used to have sort of the title of like the president's economists. They were kind of like an independent think tank inside the White House that, whose job was to give the president the best economic advice possible. Uh, the, I worked as a staffer on a council in, uh, many years ago. And uh, uh, I, my impression is what happened is that the council did its job almost too well. And, and, and nobody likes to hear what economists say. So President Clinton uh, either created or boosted the stature of the National Economic Council and put it in charge of, uh, of all of the economic agencies, essentially. And so Bob Rubin was the first head, then Laura Tyson, then Gene Sperling. That structure was retained in the Bush administration. Uh, it's currently retained in the Obama administration, and Gene Sperling is the head again. Uh, and sort of they are like the last people to see the memo now before it goes to the White House. So I think there's actually more economic input going on now than there was in the past. And I think it's being heard better because the NEC is much more politically adept than the CEA uh, tended to be. The, C the CEA's, my impression from the people I've talked to, and was it had a little bit of a passive aggressive streak to it. It's like, you're not going to like this, but, but this is what we think. Whereas the, the NEC seems to be more politically adept at saying, you know, here's how you, you, you can accomplish your goals. But I think between the, uh, I mean, the CEA is very ably led right now by Alan Kruger. And I, my understanding, I'm not an insider, but my understanding is that economists in general have a lot of input. You know, whether stuff gets decided for political reasons is different. But I think the president, both Obama and Bush, and Clinton as well, are hearing a lot of economic advice. Uh, Ladies first. Thank you. OK, so my question is, currently we have a universal health care bill that's going to be passed or like is enacted with Obamacare. And it has been efficient in some countries, but I'm wondering if you think it'll be efficient for this country, or if it'll just sort of pro propel us into more debt? Uh, so Obamacare, uh, and the president actually said in the debates that he likes this term now. It, it was originally a derogatory term that the Republicans came up with. Uh, Obamacare basically expands coverage, and it tries to cut costs by, as I mentioned, kind of squeezing the inefficient procedures out of the system. There's a statistic flowing around. It's something like 30% of all health care procedures that are done uh, are not warranted by, by, the, by the evidence of what works or not. They, either they're done for defensive reasons or because the doctor wants to just assure the patient uh, uh, that it's OK. And so the goal of, of Obamacare on that front is to understand better what works and what doesn't work uh, and move the system toward compensating for what works and away from compensating what doesn't work. Uh, what other countries do, or most other countries, is they have a single payer system with, with the government essentially as a single payer. Uh, that, that is not what we're doing in this country. We're retaining the private sector. Uh, we're working through the private sector. Uh, and so, so uh, that is a source uh, of continuing controversy, I think, among healthcare specialists. But it, Politically, it's just not an issue in the, in the U.S. to move uh, to a single payer system. Can I have a follow-up question? Sure. Okay. All right, so I, I understand that. But do you think that um, this sort of system can be efficient in the United States being a country that isn't as prone to tax? Because in Canada and European nations, they can have systems like this but they tax their, their citizens more, and that works out for them. Do you think that the United States could successfully implement universal health care then? All right, I think we can, but it's going to be hard to do it without having costs expand. One, one way to look at health care reform and why it's so hard, okay, is that doctors' incomes are going to have to go down, right? And you think about how that's going to get implemented. That's going to be very difficult because doctors deliver health care, right? And, and um, 
What I would like to see us do, basically, is just admit humility in the face of this overwhelmingly complex problem in the health sector and do three things. One is experiment with these uh, 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 defined benefit approaches where you try to squeeze out savings. The second is experiment with these uh, premium support systems to see if consumer uh, pressure can effectively reduce spending. And the third um, is to create a value-added tax that is linked to health care spending. And what that would do is acknowledge that it's going to take decades to resolve health care reform. Uh, health care is more complicated than taxes. We've had one major tax reform in the last 50 years. You know, and, and so what I would like to do is see us inoculate the deficit, if you will, from health care issues and just raise what we need to pay for health care via value-added tax while we continue to work out how best to provide health care. And uh, that would also sort of provide a referendum of sorts if people wanted more from Medicare or more from Medicaid, they would have to be willing to support higher value added taxes. Uh, whether we can do it uh, is a good question. We certainly haven't in the past, and we get caught up in these discussions about the US has the greatest health care in the world, which is true in some sense, but is not true in other senses. We spend twice as much of our economy on health care as other countries. Uh, with no visible difference in health care outcomes. So we spend 18%, they spend 9%, something like that. Uh, so that's bad news in the sense that it shows there's a lot of waste uh, in the system, but it's good news in that it shows there's a huge potential uh, for cutting the waste out. So I don't know the answer to your question, but it, 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 I do feel like it's a hard enough issue that we need to pull out all the stops. We can't, we can't just say, oh, I want to debate this perfect system versus this perfect system. We need to try everything. You know, beggars can't be choosers, basically, on health care. Thank you. My question is, how well would it work if we increase taxes, cut the spending for Medicare and Medicaid, and a lot of things are just internally aimed at our country and invest in, like, the businesses and things that um, make a lot of things that we ship out to other countries that way we could bring more money in from other countries. Um, how will it work if we invest in those and just cut back from like Medicare and Medicaid and then increase taxes? Uh, I'm sorry, how will the, how, how will it, what will the economic channels be? Is that what you're asking? Well, would it, would it work if we increase taxes? and everybody may hate me for recommending this, but if we increase taxes, you know, it may be tough for the short-term idea for all of us, but in the long-term, it'll make the greater change, which is, we've been talking about, want to help out the generations to come, and then cut back the spending for Medicare and Medicaid, which a lot of people also still may dislike me for bringing up that idea. Um, cut back that spending, take that money, invest it in the businesses and things that create the products that bring in revenue from different countries, like um, increasing output to bring in finances. Would that work out pretty well to increase taxes and then just invest in those businesses? Yeah, I think if, I understanding, if I'm understanding your question right, you're, answering, you're actually answering your own question. And that is, if we cut back on spending, uh, and raise taxes, the deficits will go down. That will free up resources uh, that would otherwise have gone to finance uh, spending uh, into, the, into the economy that can then be used to invest in, and so on. But that, that's precisely the mechanism that needs to happen is that, that uh, uh, as the government cuts back on its deficit spending as the economy recovers, uh, then that money, that, those funds, can be used by the business sector uh, to finance investment, which you know, will be new products, more productive workers, more capital, et cetera. So what's keeping us from doing that? Well, what you just said, that, that, that it's bad in the short run. Uh, nobody wants to uh, 
there's a there's a guy named Russell Long who was a senator from Louisiana who said the worst thing a politician can do is solve a constituent's problem before he knows he has one. <laughs> and uh, uh, so you don't get credit. Like, on look at Obama in 2009. I think the stimulus package and monetary policy saved the economy from going far deeper uh, down than it did. But because it didn't happen, he doesn't get credit for he doesn't seem to get credit in the public eye for averting that disaster. If the disaster had happened and he brought us back, then, then you know, it would have been worse in actuality than it turned out to be, but then people might have seen that he deserved credit for it. Right? So, so it's hard uh, uh, to get politicians to uh, do what's right in the long term if it's painful in the short run. Right. I mean, I, I really think it's that simple. Thank you. Hi, my question is, uh, has to do with the Bush tax cuts. And uh, now that we've got about 10 years of having those tax cuts in place, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about um, part of one of the justifications for having those tax cuts was that it was going to pretty much help pay for itself by increasing growth, and therefore you'd have taxes on that growth that would help offset the, the costs. I was wondering if you've looked at the data and seen if, if those uh, arguments were justified in retrospect and then secondly what would you say is kind of the sweet spot for the um, the percentage of GDP that the government should be taking somebody paid you to ask this question right <laughs> <laughs> no that was a great no uh, uh, the reason this, this is like this is like my sweet spot as an economist uh, I've done a lot of work on the Bush tax cuts I frankly think they cost us a lot in revenues and generated almost no benefits uh, if you look at where growth occurred in the last decade, it was in finance and housing. Uh, that was obviously due to low interest rates at the Fed. Uh, it had nothing to do with the tax cuts, which actually reduced the tax advantage to housing. Uh, they are regressive. They're expensive. They didn't generate growth. They led to a breakdown in the political equilibrium where uh, because taxes were cut, I feel like politicians felt, forget it about the budget deficit, and then they increased spending on military and Medicare and other stuff. Uh, uh, I, I, I think they were a very bad policy. Uh, I would like to see them end. Uh, I believe that, end, that I did a paper in 2002 that argued that they would reduce the long-term growth of the economy because uh, you can think of tax cuts as having two effects. One is lower tax rates help people, encourage people to work, save, invest, take more risks, et cetera. The other is the lower revenue raises the deficit, and so inc reduces national saving, reduces national investment, and so on. And if you looked at the structure of the Bush tax cuts, or when I did, I found that the deficit effects, the negative deficit effects, outweighed the positive incentive effects. Uh, and uh, a couple, since then, uh, several other people who have looked at these policies uh, including the Congressional Budget Office, have reached the same conclusion uh, that these things are detrimental to the long-term health of the economy, not not uh, not beneficial. So, and then the the second part, what what do you think is the sweet spot for the the percentage of GDP that the government should tax? Oh, um, so the yes, thank you. The historical average here is 18 percent. Uh, that's the number you'll hear a lot. I don't see how we go forward with. 18% as, as a norm. Uh, the uh, amount of spending we would need to cut would be enormous. And it's perfectly normal for a society with higher interest costs and higher health care costs and retirement social security costs uh, uh, to raise taxes to bear that, to, to pay for those costs. So I would guess, if, if, I, if I could set things up I would get long-term revenues somewhere between 22 and 24 percent of GDP. And then if you did that, you'd need to get spending down to like 25 to 27 percent of GDP. You can have that little gap there because the economy grows over time. So spending can be slightly higher than, than revenues. But I don't see any way we do this staying at 18 uh, percent of GDP. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you spoke a lot about domestic public policy, and clearly that's your area. So forgive me if this gets a little bit away from it, but can you speak to the role of international trade 
in what you're speaking about here, particularly as it relates to monetary policy and debt financing? Sure. Uh, we have benefited enormously from the problems in Europe over the last few years. We've had this massive capital inflow. One of the, one of the uh, ironies of the whole Great Recession was we created this financial crisis, exported it to the rest of the world, and then they sent enormous amounts of money back to the United States. And so if you think about it, that's a pretty good business to be in. Um, and uh, uh, we benefited tremendously from that. That's why, that's why interest rates are so low right now, as well as on Fed policy as well, but we're getting tremendous capital inflows from the rest of the world. Uh, and um, that's helpful in the short run, but it's not sustainable. And uh, so as, we, as, the, uh, as the domestic economy needs, adjusts, uh, the trade balance will need to adjust too. Now that will happen naturally if consumption goes down and saving goes up. Uh, but but uh, that is an important part of the adjustment uh, process that has to occur. Thank you. Uh, we live in a global economy, and uh, there's been lots of talk about China and borrowing money from them, which was one of the reasons we were going to ax Big Bird, and also about how China has been playing uh, their part with their currency and have been uh, valuing it too high. Uh, how does this affect the debt in the long term, and where do you see the solution uh, emerging from? All right. These are great questions, by the way. Um, uh, so John Maynard Keynes said once that if a bank lends you $1,000, you have a problem. If a bank lends you a $1 million, it has a problem. Okay? And China is now the bank that has lent us proverbially a $1 million, obviously far more than that. Uh, 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 they are, the, I believe, the single largest foreign holders of U.S. debt at this point. So, so uh, there's a couple of questions. One is how long can this go on? And, and the question, I think, is, uh, the answer is, I think, is for quite a while. Uh, the second question is, you know, could they, could they sell us out? Could they say we're not buying treasury bonds anymore? you know, you guys need to get your house in order, et cetera? The answer is yes, but if they did that, treasury bond values would drop, and uh, they would be one of the biggest losers in that, in that situation. So uh, our, 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 our economies are kind of intertwined at this point, and it's easy to um, uh, demagogue this as, as, you know, we're selling ourselves to China and, and so on, uh, but what has to happen basically is, what's happening is they're saving much more than we are, or saving the share of their economy much more than we are. And so that excess saving has to go somewhere. It's coming to the United States. Uh, and this is one reason why a consumption tax would be helpful in the United States. As we adjust, we need to reduce our consumption levels relative to GDP, raise our saving levels. As that happens, uh, and as China is raising its consumption levels and re reducing its saving levels, uh, there will be a natural adjustment. Uh, but but um, this is sort of the flip side of the, of the question I was just asked earlier. Uh, it, it is a concern, but I guess it's not what I'm most worried about. I don't think, uh, uh, well, let me just leave that. I, it's, it's, certainly you wouldn't want to ignore it, but, but uh, I don't, well, I don't think it's the most important thing, but I, I will add one thing. That we need a spark, okay? We need, the problem with the deficit from a political point of view is uh, it's not like World War II where there's a very clear enemy who was evil and who was against all of us, right? With the deficit, the enemy is ourselves. And, and so it, there's really kind of a, a zero-sum aspect of it within American society. Do you want to tax high-income households more? Do you want to cut health care for seniors? You know, do you, you know, these are, these are uh, we're battling ourselves. One thing that might galvanize things politically, and I, I'm, I am not China baiting here, I'm just making an intellectual point, is if there were something to unify the country, uh, if the country felt like we were dependent on China more than we wanted to be, uh, 
that could be a motivating force that brought us together rather than pulling us apart. Likewise, if the country thought that, that we're mortgaging our kids' future, all right, that could be something that could bring the country together. Uh, and what we need is those, uh, the latter one obviously is better than the China one, but, but what we need are the forces that bring people together and recognize that there is a common uh, issue here. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it, it could be that China helps serve that purpose, but then you worry that it gets demagogued and, and you know, uh, in a way that's not helpful. But we do need some sort of common, common goal here. Otherwise, uh, we'll just continue to, to lock heads. Thank you, Mr. Or Professor Gale. Um, I'm curious as to how your uh, proposed reforms to the current health care policy, as well as President Obama's and any, I guess, future conservative uh, rebuttal to uh, health care reform, will affect um, the growth of health care as an industry and whether or not you believe that that industry could be the spark by which our economy is reboosted. Hmm. Talk about a Faustian bargain, right? Uh, uh, I think that actually housing is the single most important industry in getting the economy going again. If you look at the typical recession, uh, it's the interest sensitive sectors of the economy, like autos and, car autos and housing, that go down when the. Well, let me, let me take a step back. The typical recession occurs when the economy's overheating, the Fed raises interest rates, the interest-sensitive interest sectors of the economy fall, mainly housing and autos. Then the economy slows down, then the Fed says, okay, everything's fine, we're going to reduce interest rates, and then the interest-sensitive sectors of the economy bounce back. Okay? Uh, that didn't happen this time around. Uh, we had a, a different type of recession. We had a recession not because the Fed was raising interest rates, we had a a recession even though the Fed was cutting interest rates to zero. And uh, we had a recession because of collapse in the housing market, the, the collapse in the financial markets, et cetera. And so uh, because the interest rates were already at zero, there is nothing the Fed, there's nothing the Fed could do to, to get housing and autos back. We, we actually had, um, uh, our, the auto industry, for a variety of reasons, happened to be kind of overstocked relative to income uh, at when the recession hit. The housing sector, of course, the floor fell out. So it's taken a long time for the auto sector to come back, and it's coming back. It's taking much longer for the housing sector to come back. And uh, we probably need more targeted policies there. Uh, but I think that's where, if you're looking for a culprit as to why the recovery is as tepid as it is, um, I think relative to other recoveries, what's not happening is that the housing sector is not bouncing back. Healthcare just kind of chugs along. Uh, it's sort of a slow and steady uh, type of thing. I don't think we're going to get a cyclical bounce from healthcare. Uh, and in the long run, of course, we want people to be healthy. We want a healthy healthcare sector, but we don't want to be financing waste, uh, wasteful spending in the healthcare sector. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering what you think in the short term the effect would be of combining a higher tax on high income households with a New Deal style focus on infrastructure spending that would create jobs in the skilled labor market. Ah, okay. Uh, so let me relate this to the fiscal cliff. Uh, what I would like to see us do is two things. One is enact a large temporary stimulus package that include payroll tax cuts, infrastructure spending, and aid to the states. That, by the way, the other industry that's not recovering right now is state and local government relative to other recoveries. So they've actually been cutting employment. So, so that and housing, I think, are the two big, I, I left that out earlier. Um, but I would like to see us do that and go over the fiscal cliff, which would be letting all those tax cuts expire. Uh, 
And the idea behind that combination of policies is to stimulate the economy now to get it going, but to go over the fiscal cliff so we're on that better budget path that, that I was talking about be, be before, and that entails increases in taxes on high-income households. And the idea behind that is uh, once you get on that path, uh, you've done the hard work of raising revenues and cutting spending. And, and if Congress then wants to mess around with a budget neutral package that rearranges how we raise taxes or rearranges how we, we, we cut spending, that's fine. That would be much easier than enacting a package that has to raise taxes uh, and cut spending. So uh, the package I laid out, the temporary stimulus thing, and going over the fiscal cliff uh, actually includes, I think, everything uh, you mentioned. So I guess my answer is I would do more than just that. But that, to me, seems like elements of good policy. Thank you. Hi. I'm a small business owner. And I'm just going back to 2009, but I'm an opening statement. I just had lunch with a banker, and he's very upset because he keeps saying how you can bring a horse to the water, but you can't make the horse drink. And he was talking to me as a business owner why I didn't want to borrow money. And, uh, you know, so I've cut back over the last four years, payroll. Uh, I've painted that uh, hoist in my gas station, you know, tuned up a little bit. But basically I'm going green, too, because I'm reducing, reusing, recycling. But at the same time, back in 2009 when Brock had all this money from the stimulus thing, why didn't they bring back Section 38 property? of the Internal Revenue Code. It was called Investment Tax Credit. It had to do where any small business owner or big corporation, if you suddenly wanted to buy a $200,000 car wash, you right off the bat knew that you were going to get 10% back from the federal government you know, as a f tax credit. And I'm just, with all the economic policy that had been kicked around, why wasn't ITC brought back in 2009? Because if you suddenly would have told small business owners all over the United States, all over Alaska, Montana, that you can get 10% or I even said at the time when Brock came in office, I said, they should offer a double, two for one, 20% back. Mm -hmm. But overnight, you'd have small business owners buying a new hoist, a new gas pump, air conditioning unit. It would have put inspectors for the local governments and cities back to work. It would have put carpenters. It would have put electricians. And it wasn't like this. Because remember, there was that lull there where all the money was being divvied up with all the different highway projects and bridges. Mm -hmm. But there was not that immediate jump start that ITC would do. And I'm just, maybe it was a bad policy that I'm not aware of 20 years ago or, you know, on the recapture of ITC when you got rid of the asset, but just why was that not looked at or why is that kind of, no one's ever brought it up? Uh, so in terms of business incentives, um, I think they went with, uh, there, there are different ways to encourage businesses to invest. Uh, businesses get to write off the costs of their capital investment so o over time. So one way to encourage businesses to invest is to give them more accelerated, more generous write-offs. Uh, another way is, as you mentioned, to give them a, a direct credit. It actually was a refundable credit. Credit extra. for, for and you could use uh, it with your bank as, as yeah. a part of your down payment. Yeah, and so I think for whatever reason, in 2009, they went with the accelerated depreciation, the expensing, rather than ITC. I don't. I'm not privy to the internal discussions, but I imagine, I'm sure, I'm sure it was talked about because the, you think about who the advisors were at that time, uh, Larry Summers in particular had, has encouraged the, IT, the ITC uh, in the past, but I don't know why they went with expensing rather than ITC. Okay. Yeah. Just always wondered because it just seemed like it would have been just a great jump start. Okay. Um, I have a question about whether you are optimistic about, as you mentioned, the stages of grief, whether people are getting past the anger and denial and maybe get to acceptance and rationally discussing what to do. Um, part of this is just seeing such things, you know, the example floated, the bit person mentioning, axing Big Bird brought it to mind that um, somebody talks about cutting funding in one area, and it's an emotional issue, I think, when they bring up something like PBS. And I know that it's a very tiny part of the budget, but if you can't talk about whether government should be cutting back on something that includes 
Sesame Street, as anyone who knows, a toy store is very heavily merchandised and would presumably survive without government support. How are people going to discuss things which have very significant consequences, including cuts to health care and military things? Do you think we're reaching that point, or is it going to take longer? Um, I'm very bad at predicting. Um, about a year ago, I remember saying that I'm really psyched about the 2012 election because it's going to be about how we deal with the fiscal problem. And Canada's going to present competing visions. We're going to have a national debate. And uh, somebody's going to win and have a mandate to do something. And obviously, that's not happening. Uh, uh, and maybe it's just not the type of thing one can campaign on. The whole Big Bird NPR thing uh, is, uh, is interesting a couple ways. One, I saw somebody tweeted before the debate that it, their only advice for Mitt Romney was that if they were going to cut government agencies, that they actually remember the names of which agencies they were going to cut. Uh, uh, so he chose a very well-known one. But you know, NPR is nothing in terms of the government budget. It's a tiny, teeny fraction of that remaining 13% that I said. So it's a good example of, of uh, uh, I mean, you could, you could eliminate the NPR budget, and it would, you would not see it in, in you know, the first three or four significant digits of government spending, right? And so, so um, it doesn't seem to me that my prediction from last year was right. Uh, and I, I don't know. I, it's one of those things where, where uh, if you ask how we're going to get there, right, you can ask two questions. Are we going to get there? And to which I think the answer is yes. If you ask me how are we going to get there, I'll say, I don't know, okay? <laughs> There's no, any, any feasible solution right now, I think, is impossible to achieve. That doesn't mean that we won't get to a solution. It just means whatever the solution ultimately is, it'll be something that we currently think is impossible, if that makes sense, okay? <laughs> um, it sounds a little Alice in Wonderland-ish about believing impossible things, but... But, you know, people, there's a process that people have to go through. And you can do these budget exercises online, like the Concord Coalition or other places. The Center for Responsible Federal Budget has these budget exercises online. And you can see how tough it is to do this, to bring the budget in balance. And um, uh, I think we're way ahead of where we were two years ago. Um, as someone who's worked on the budget for 15 years, I can see massive changes in public discussion of it. But it's still, it's still very early in the game, and it's still, we're still nowhere where we need to be. But, but um, you know, the Bowles Simpson Commission, I think, did an important thing. The Domenici Rivlin Commission did an important thing. Uh, and and um, uh, I don't know, it's almost like, you don't really need a budget specialist to do this. You need someone whose skills are more like that of a marriage counselor <laughs> and, and, you know, sort of someone, someone who can bring sides together. Because the problems, in 2011, the sides were $400 billion apart on a $4 trillion deal over 10 years, right? Well, GDP over the next 10 years is going to be $200 trillion, right? So 400, being $400 billion off, over 10 years is not very much uh, relative to the size of the economy, relative to the size of government spending over that time. They could have reached an agreement at that point if they wanted to, right? If you're a politician and you're $400 billion apart on a $4 trillion deal, well, it's not hard to figure out how you compromise, right? Half of $400 billion is $200 billion, and gee, each side gives up $200 billion, and you've got a deal. If you wanted a deal, that's what you would do. I think both sides made a decision at that point that they didn't want a deal, that they wanted to go into the election in opposition to the other party, uh, as opposed to a stance that we are working with the other party. And what has to change is they have to understand that a, I think a majority of the American public wants them to solve these problems uh, rather than oppose each other. And, um, uh, once that happens, then the things we currently think are impossible uh, 
uh, will become possible. How's that for optimistic? Speaking of believing in impossible things, uh, given the fact that we are constrained to living on one planet, is it possible to continually ensure that economic growth is going to bring us out of this fiscal issue? Uh, or are we just a very ingenious people and can figure out how to uh, grow our economy given the, the constraint of one planet with finite resources? I gotta say, these are great questions. Um, uh, I wish I had equally great answers. Um, I think if you look back over the pace, uh, you know, technological change is a cumulative process, and um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it has gigantic effects over time. I mean, you, I, I, when I was your age, we didn't have personal computers. Okay? Just think about that. Uh, I actually used cards to do a computer program. You have that stack of cards. You can go to the museum and see them now. Uh, so there's just been, there's been enormous changes. I was reading an article about a guy who had been in the theater in New York, and he like turned 100, and somebody asked him what was the most amazing thing that happened in the theater in his 100 years, and he said, I like electricity. And, you know, we just take it for granted, but for him it was a monumental change, and now, I mean, all this, I, I, I am a firm believer in technological change. I think we will continue to figure out ways, I mean, mar markets respond to incentives, I think one reason to get the energy tax in place is to encourage uh, smart energy, for example, smart energy consumption, smart energy, energy development. Um, I mean, the stuff that's going on in the computer world is incredible. It, 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 uh, it, it, I've got a, a sort of particular window on that. My son is an engineer, and like he can actually do things and get things done. And you know we just go around in circles in the policy world about how to solve these problems. But, but I, I, I believe that we will continue to have enormous technological change, and that's a good thing. Whether that will be enough to save us from ourselves uh, is a good question to end it with. Thank you. Yeah.